So now you've paid respects to two of the four holy sites that Lord Buddha recommends we pay respects to the place of the enlightenment, the place of the Mahaparinibbana. In a few more days we will go to the place where Lord the Bodhisattva was born and after that we will go to where he set the wheel of Dhamma turning. There was quite a lot uh, that happened around the time of the Mahaparinibbana, so I'll begin reading. I just want to check one last thing. Yesterday I asked we went straight to the Mahaparinibbana temple. It was quite busy. We just had an hour after a long time in the bus and I asked how many people felt peaceful in moments. Half the people did. This morning we had nearly two hours in there. In that time I'm interested to know how many people had peaceful meditation at some point in the morning session. You raise your hands. Yeah, very good. Did anybody feel sad? Very good. You all understand the deathless. So, we're picking up. Lord Buddha has just told Ananda that his attainment of Mahaparinibbana is unnegotiable, destined, fated, definitely going to happen because he relinquished the will to live. And he, Ananda asks him three times, please live until the end of the age. And the Buddha replies, it is impossible for the perfect one to go back on those words. Let us go to the hall with the pointed roof in the great wood, Ananda. Even so, Lord, the Venerable Ananda replied, and when they went, the Blessed One addressed the Venerable Ananda, Ananda, go and summon all the bhikkhus in the neighborhood of Vesali to meet in the service hall. Even so, Lord, the Venerable Ananda replied, when he had done that, he informed the Blessed One. The Blessed One went to the service hall, sat down on the seat made ready, and he addressed the bhikkhus thus, Bhikkhus, I have now taught you things that I have directly known. These you should thoroughly learn and maintain in being, develop and constantly put into effect, so that this holy life may endure long. You should do so for the welfare and happiness of many, out of compassion for the world, for the good and welfare and happiness of gods and men. And what are these things? They are the four foundations of mindfulness, the four right endeavors, the four great efforts, sometimes translated as, the four bases for success, the five spiritual faculties, the five spiritual powers, the seven enlightenment factors, and the noble eightfold path. I have taught you these things having directly known them, so that's called the 37 Bodhi Pakyatamas, 37 Wings of Awakening. These you should thoroughly learn for the good and welfare and happiness of gods and men. Then the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus thus, Indeed, bhikkhus, I declare this to you, it is in the nature of all formations to dissolve, attain perfection through diligence, soon the Perfect One will attain final Nibbana. The Sublime One having said this, the Master said further, Ripe is my age and little life remains to me. I leave you and depart, my own refuge is made. Be diligent and mindful. Be virtuous, O bhikkhus. With thoughts well concentrated, keep watch over your hearts. Who lives out diligently this dharma and discipline will leave the round of rebirths and make an end of pain. So he's just got a few more months to live. And as we can see, Lord Buddha continues to carry out his duty impeccably, training the monks, explaining the Dhamma and the discipline and also saying that to practice diligently is also of benefit for gods and humans. He also says very clearly, I've done my work, I'm liberated, and now you make sure you attain that same goal. After that he went to a place called Bandagama and he often gave this talk on the Dhamma to the bhikkhus. Such is virtue, such is concentration, such is understanding. Sila, Samadhi and Banya. Concentration fortified with virtue brings great benefits and fruits. So that's your Samadhi, practicing your Samadhi on the foundation of keeping your ethical precepts. Understanding fortified with concentration brings great benefits and great fruits. So that's your contemplation, your Bhavana 
on the foundation of a stabilized concentration, the heart fortified with understanding becomes completely liberated from taints, from the taint of sensual desire, the taint of being, the taint of views, and the taint of ignorance. That's another way the Buddha describes the way ignorance and delusion, greed, hatred, and delusion are destroyed through the practice of sila, samadhi, and banya. When the Blessed One had lived at Bandagama, as long as he chose, he said to the Venerable Ananda, Come Ananda, let us go to Hatigama. So he's wandering in stages towards Kusanara. The next place he went was called Boganagara. And then he went to Pawa. He said to Ananda, Come Ananda, let us go to Pawa. Even so, Lord, the Venerable Ananda replied, Then the Blessed One journeyed to Pawa with a large community of bhikkhus while there. While there, he lived in a mango grove in power belonging to Chunda, the goldsmith's son. Chunda, the goldsmith's son, heard that the Blessed One was living in his grove. He then went to the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, he sat down at one side. Then the Blessed One instructed, urged, roused, and encouraged him with talk on the Dhamma. Afterwards, Chunda said to the Blessed One, Lord, let the Blessed One with the Sangha of Bhikkhus accept tomorrow's meal from me. The Blessed One consented in silence. When Chunda saw that he accepted, he rose from his seat and after paying homage to the Blessed One, he departed, keeping him on his right. When the night was over, he had good food of various kinds prepared at his house and plenty of hogs mincemeat. After which he had the time announced, It is time, Lord, the meal is ready. Then it being morning, the Blessed One dressed and taking his bowl and outer robe, he went with the Sangha of Bhikkhus to Chunda, the goldsmith's son's house. He sat down on the prepared seat. Then he told Chunda, Serve the hog's mincemeat you have. You have had prepared to me, Chunda, but serve any other food you have had prepared to the Sangha of Bhikkhus. Even so, Lord. Chunda replied, and so he did. Then the Blessed One told him, Chunda, if any hog's mince meat is left over, bury it in a hole. I do not see anyone other than the perfect one in this world with its deities, its maras and its brahmas. In this generation with its monks and brahmans, with its princes and men who could digest it if he ate it. Even so, Lord, Chunda replied and he buried the leftover hog's mince meat in a hole. Then he went to the Blessed One and after paying homage to him, he sat down at one side. When the Blessed One instructed him with talk on the Dhamma, after which he got up from his seat and departed. It was after the Blessed One had eaten the food provided by Chunda the goldsmith's son that, he had, that a severe sickness attacked him with a flux of blood accompanied by violent, deadly pains. He bore it without complaint, mindful and fully aware. Then he said to the Venerable Ananda, Come Ananda, let us go to Kusanara. So this is an important thing to notice. Lord Buddha has been cultivating virtue and merit for four incalculably long periods and a hundred thousand eons. He has mountains and mountains of merit, enormous virtue. He's completely liberated. And the body is still subject to sickness and death. So there's no perfection of the conditions. This is the thing to notice here even Lord Buddha. Remember Sariputta as well? Sariputta, the monk attending Sariputta, it said in the paragraph, as one pail was brought in, another pail was taken out. The diarrhea, the dysentery that Sariputta had, chief disciple. So this is the nature of the conditioned world, the nature of bodies. Even so, Lord, the Venerable Ananda replied, on the way the Blessed One left the road and went to the roof of a, root of a tree, he said to the Venerable Ananda, Please fold my outer robe in four and lay it out. I am tired. I will sit down. Even so, Lord, the Venerable Ananda replied, The Blessed One sat down on a seat made ready. When he had done so, he said, Ananda, please fetch me some water. I am thirsty and I will drink. The Venerable Ananda said, Lord, some five hundred carts have just gone by. The water has been churned up by the wheels. It is flowing poorly and is thick and cloudy. The river Kakuta is not far off with clear, pleasant, cool water and smooth banks. It is delightful. The Blessed One can drink there and cool his limbs. A 
The second time the Blessed One asked and received the same reply. A third time the Blessed One said, Ananda, please fetch me some water, I'm thirsty and I will drink. Even so, Lord, the Venerable Ananda replied, he took a bowl and went to the stream. Then the stream, which had been churned up by the wheels and was flowing poorly, thick and cloudy, flowed clear and clean as soon as the Vener Venerable Ananda came to it. He was astonished. Then he took water for drinking in the bowl, and he returned to the Blessed One and told what had happened, adding, Lord, let the, let the Blessed One drink the water, let the Sublime One drink the water, and the Blessed One drank the water. A Malian came by, wanted to offer, that's from the kingdom of Mala, wanted to offer some very special robes to the Buddha and Ananda, with some gold thread it seems. Then Pukasa the Malian told a man, please fetch me a pair of cloth of gold robes, pressed and ready to wear. Yes, Lord, the man answered, and he brought them. Then Pukusa took them to the Blessed One. Lord, let the Blessed One out of compassion accept from me this pair of cloth of gold robes, pressed and ready to wear. Then Pukusa, you may clothe me in one and another in the other. Yes, Lord, he replied, and he did so. Then the Blessed One instructed, urged, roused and encouraged Pukusa, the Malian, with a talk on the Dhamma. After which Pukusa got up from his seat, paid homage to the Blessed One and departed, keeping him on his right. Soon after he had gone, the Venerable Ananda placed the pair of cloth of gold robes pressed and ready to wear on the Blessed One's body. But then it seemed as if their brilliance died out. The Venerable Ananda, Ananda said, it is wonderful, Lord, it is marvelous how pure and bright the color of the Blessed One's skin is. When I place this pair of cloth of gold robes pressed and ready to wear on the Blessed One, on the Blessed One's body, it seemed as if their brilliance died out. So it is, Ananda, so it is. There are two occasions when the color of the Perfect One's skin becomes exceptionally clear and bright. What are the two? They are the eve of his discovery of the Supreme Full Enlightenment, and the eve of his attainment of final Nibbāna, with the Nibbāna element without result of past clinging left. In fact, Ananda, it is in the last watch of this coming night, between the twin sala trees in the Malian sala tree grove, at the turn into Kusanara, that the Perfect One will attain final Nibbāna. You remember that Sujata's milkmaid had seen the Bodhisattva under the goat herd tree and his, she thought he was the tree deva because his body was looked golden color and radiant and she rushed and told Sujata. Sujata made a special milk rice to offer the, what she thought was a tree deva. That was the, the other time when the, the Bodhisattva's complexion was exceptionally clear and bright. The other occasion is this, just before the Buddha attains Mahaparinibbana. Even so, Lord, the Venerable Ananda replied, now the Buddha is concerned about Chunda, Chunda's feelings, because Chunda was the one, the goldsmith's son, was the one who offered the pigs, the hogs, mincemeat, and now the Buddha is sick. First of all, the Buddha lies down on his robe, folded in four. I think Chundaka is another of Lord Buddha's attendants. Yes, he tells Chundaka to fold his robe in four, and he lies down in a lion's posture with the right leg on top of the left, mindful and fully aware, he tells Chundika, no it's not, sorry, Chundika is attending him, but later he tells Ananda. Ananda, it is possible that someone might provoke remorse in the goldsmith's son. Chunda, thus, it is no gain, it is a loss for you, Chunda, that the perfect ones attained final Nibbāna after getting his last alms food from you. Now any such remorse of this must be counted thus, it is a gain. It is a great gain for you, Chunda, that the Perfect One attained final Nibbāna after getting his last alms fruit from you. I heard and learned this from the Blessed One's own lips, friend Chunda. These two kinds of alms food have equal fruit and equal ripening, and their fruit and ripening is far greater than any other. What are the two? They are the alms food after eating, after eating which a Perfect One discovers the Supreme Full Enlightenment, and the alms food after eating which the Perfect One attains final Nibbāna, with the Nibbāna element without result of past clinging left. Chunda, the goldsmith's son, has stored up a deed that will lead to longevity, 
to good position, to happiness, to fame and to heaven, any remorse of his must be counted thus. Knowing the meaning of this, the Blessed Buddha then uttered this exclamation, When a man gives, his merit will increase, no enmity can grow in the restrained. The skilled shun evil, they attain Nibbana by ending greed and hatred and delusion. Then the Blessed One said to Venerable Ananda, Come Ananda, let us go to the further bank of the river Hiranyawati, to the Malian's Sala tree grove, at the turn into Kusinara. Even so, Lord, the Venerable Ananda replied, Then the Blessed One went with a large community of bhikkhus to the further bank of the Hiranyawati and on to the Malian's Sala tree grove at the turn into Kusinara. Then he said to the Venerable Ananda, Ananda, please make a couch ready for me with its head to the north between the twin Sala trees. I am tired and I will lie down. Even so, Lord, the Venerable Ananda replied, and he did so. Then the Blessed One placed himself in a lion sleeping pose on his right side with one foot overlapping the other, mindful and fully aware. Now on that occasion, the twin Sala trees were quite covered with blossoms, though it was not the season. They scattered and sprinkled and strewed them on the Blessed One's body out of veneration for him, and heavenly mandarava flowers and heavenly sandalwood powder fell from the sky and were scattered and sprinkled and strewn over the Blessed One's body out of veneration for him, and heavenly music was played and heavenly songs were sung in the sky out of veneration for him. So that's where we were, we were meditating this morning, where the statue is, that's where it is understood that the Lord Buddha lay down to enter final Mahaparinibbana. The Blessed One said to Venerable Ananda, Ananda, the twin Sala trees are quite covered with blossoms, though it is not the season. They scatter and sprinkle and strew them on the Perfect One's body out of veneration for him. Heavenly Mandarava flowers and heavenly sandalwood powder fall from the sky and are scattered and sprinkled and strewn over the Perfect One's body out of veneration for him. Heavenly music is played, heavenly songs are sung in the sky out of veneration for him. But this is not how a perfect one is honored, respected, revered, venerated or reverenced. Rather, it is the bhikkhu or bhikkhuni, or the man or woman lay follower, who lives according to the Dhamma, who enters upon the proper way, who walks in the Dhamma, that honors, respects, reveres and venerates a perfect one with the highest veneration of all. Therefore, Ananda, train thus, we will live in the way of the Dhamma, entering upon the proper way and walking in the Dhamma. So we can see from this that all of the devas are doing what they do to accumulate merit and express their love and respect. The flowers blossoming out of season, I'm sure that's the work of the devas. The sandalwood falling from heaven, Mandarava flowers, the Mandarava tree is found in Dhawatimsa heaven, it's a very large blossom. It only falls on the earth at such a time when the Buddha is entering Mahaparinibbana. Again, the devas, the Gandhavas are singing, uh, celestial musicians playing their beautiful melodies. But the Buddha says it's through practicing Dhamma that we express our respect in the most appropriate way to uh, Samma Sambuddha, which is what we've been doing with our chanting, our study, our meditation. So it is good to know, isn't it? It's nice to know that Lord Buddha would approve of that. That's what he sees as being the most worthy way to demonstrate one's respect, one's gratitude. It was very beautiful today, wasn't it, when the Bangladeshi group all lit their candles and offered lights at the jetty of the cremation. It's a quite beautiful expression of faith. Lord Buddha praises the practice of Dhamma as superior. Just then, the Venerable Upavana was standing in front of the Blessed One, fanning him. Then the Blessed One dismissed him, saying, Go away, Bhikkhu, do not stand in front of me. The Venerable Ananda thought, The Venerable Upavana has long been an attendant on the Blessed One, near to him and closely associated with him. Yet at the last moment, the Blessed One dismisses him, saying, Go away, Bhikkhu, do not stand in front of me. What is the reason for this? He asked this question of the Blessed One, who replied, this is amazing. Ananda, most of the deities from ten world systems have come to see the perfect one. For twelve leagues all around, Arjun Punya said that's about 70 miles, the Sala tree grove, there is not a place the size of the pricking of a horse's hair tip, 
not occupied by deities. They are protesting. We have come from far to see the perfect one. Every now and then perfect ones arise in the world, accomplished and fully enlightened. Tonight, in the last watch, the perfect one's attainment of final Nibbana will take place. And this eminent bhikkhu is standing in front of the Blessed One, obstructing us, so that at the last moment we shall not be able to see the Perfect One. Deities are protesting Ananda. But Lord, what deities has the Blessed One in mind? There are deities who are percipient of earth in space. They are tearing their hair and weeping, stretching out their arms and weeping, falling down and rolling back and forth, crying out, so soon the Blessed One will attain final Nibbāna, so soon the Sublime One will attain final Nibbāna, so soon the eye will vanish from the world. And there are deities who are percipient of earth in earth, who are doing likewise. But those deities who are free from lust, resign themselves, mindful and fully aware. Formations are impermanent. How could it be that what is born, come to being, formed and bound to fall, should not fall? That is not possible. Lord, formerly bhikkhus who had spent the rains in different parts used to come to see the perfect one. So we were able to see and to show respect to admirable bhikkhus. Lord, when the blessed one is gone, we shall not be able to do so anymore. Ananda, there are four places for a faithful clansman to see which may be his inspiration. What are the four? Here the perfect one was born. That is a place for a faithful clansman to see, which may be his inspiration. Here the perfect one discovered the supreme full enlightenment. That is a place for a faithful clansman to see, which may be his inspiration. Here the perfect one set rolling the matchless wheel of the Dhamma. That is a place for a faithful clansman to see, which may be his inspiration. Here the perfect one attained final Nibbana, with a Nibbana element without result of past clinging left. That is a place for a faithful clansman to see, which may be his inspiration. Faithful bhikkhus and bhikkhunis and men and women lay followers will come, saying, Here the Perfect One was born. Here the Perfect One discovered the supreme full enlightenment. Here the Perfect One set a rolling the matchless wheel of Dhamma. And here the Perfect One attained final Nibbana, with the Nibbana element without result of past clinging. And all those who travel to visit shrines with confident hearts reappear on the dissolution of the body after death in a happy destination in a heavenly world. So here Lord Buddha, coming from the Lord Buddha himself, when we can no longer pay respects to Lord Buddha in person, Lord Buddha says, pay respects at the place of the birth of the Bodhisattva, the place of enlightenment, the place of the first teaching, and the place of the Mahaparinibbana. And he also says that it's going to be, it brings great benefit. All those who travel to visit these shrines with confident hearts reappear on the dissolution of the body after death in a happy destination. Are you happy about that? Yes. Me too. <laughs> Lord, how should we treat the perfect one's remains? Ananda, do not preoccupy yourselves about venerating the perfect one's remains. Please strive for your own goal. Devote yourselves to your own goal. Dwell diligent, ardent, and self-controlled for your own good. There are wise warriors and brahmins and householders who believe in the Perfect One. They will see to venerating the Perfect One's remains. So understanding that Ananda is a stream enterer, but not yet an arahant. So here he is wanting to do his job impeccably, which is probably why he's not yet an arahant. He was so completely committed to taking care of the Buddha's every need. And the Buddha says, Ananda, time to finish your work. Ananda being Ananda asks for a second time, but Lord, how shall we treat the perfect one's remains? Treat the perfect one's remains in the same way that the remains of a universal monarch who turns the wheel of righteousness are treated. So a universal monarch basically means like the ruler of the world, the whole world. And if you recall, actually we haven't read that yet, we're reading it in a few days, the sage who came to see the baby Bodhisattva just a few days after he was born was looking at the signs on the baby Bodhisattva and he said he was going to be one of two things, a wheel-turning monarch or a Buddha, a great spiritual teacher. So, how do you treat a wheel-turning monarch's remains? 
They wrap his remains in new cloth, then they wrap them in well-beaten cloth, then they wrap them in new cloth, and proceeding in that way, they wrap them in 500 twin layers. Then they place them in an iron oil vessel, which they close with another vessel. Then they make a pyre with all kinds of scents and burn the remains. Then they build a monument to him at the four crossroads. That is how they treat the remains of a universal monarch who turns the wheel of righteousness and the perfect one's remains should be treated in the same way. The perfect one's monument should be built at the four crossroads and whoever shall put flowers or scents on it or whitewash it or shall worship it or feel confidence in his heart there, that will be a long for his welfare and happiness. There are those four who are worthy of a monument. What four? A perfect one, accomplished and fully enlightened. A Pacheka Buddha. A perfect one's disciple who is an Arahant. And a universal monarch who turns the wheel of righteousness. And what is the aim in view of which any of these four is worthy of a monument? There are many who feel confidence in their hearts, thinking, this is the monument of the Blessed One, accomplished and fully enlightened. Or this is the monument of that Blessed One, a Pacheka Buddha, or this is the monument of a disciple of the Blessed One, and this is a monument of that righteous and lawful King. When they feel confidence in their hearts there, on the dissolution of the body after death, they reappear in a happy destination, even in a heavenly world. So this is a very important instruction, actually, because the, it's very clear the direct correlation of when you gladden the mind with faith, and confidence about somebody who's worthy of that faith and confidence. It's very conducive to rebirth in heaven or a happy destination. So, some modern people, Asians less so, but some modern people sometimes neglect faith-based practices. They want to get straight down to the methods of trying to develop insight. But they often find that the insight doesn't go so deep as quickly as they like. And basically, faith-based practices gladden the mind, brighten the mind. They also produce powerful merit. Lord Buddha is saying there's a direct correlation here. When the mind is gladdened, when the mind is brightened, conducive to confidence in their hearts, on the dissolution of the body after death, they reappear in a happy destination, even in a heavenly world. And we can see this, can't we, in places like Bogaya. You see the Tibetans bowing all day, they're actually quite radiant and joyful and they're people sitting under the Bodhi tree for many hours and people circumambulating. You can see the pilgrims, especially in India, if you compare the average Indian person in the holy sites, the level of radiance and the level of joy, when you compare it to the pilgrims who've traveled here to express their devotion with faith. And I think you can see there's quite a difference, isn't there, in their facial expressions, in their radiance, in their level of happiness. It's quite ex extreme. So that's for their benefit now, or our benefit, because we're also doing this spiritual practice. But it's also producing a merit which seems to be likely to ripen at the time of death. So this is important to know, and this is why Lord Buddha says, come and pay respects at these four holy sites. This will be for your benefit for a long time to come. But it's also he was praising some people can be dismissive of devotional practice and paying respects at monuments. People think that that's... You see, when a stream enterer overcomes their attachment to superstitious rites and rituals, that means believing that those rites and rituals will enlighten you. That's what the Sotapanna sees through. But the Sotapanna doesn't stop doing it. They, just, they understand that it's not going to enlighten them. But wise people do practices that produce merit. And the Buddha says, don't criticize people. In another sutta, the Buddha said, don't criticize people who do practices for the sake of producing merit. Merit is synonymous with happiness. So producing merit, when you know how to do a rite or a ritual, mindfully, for the sake of producing merit, that merit has a function of ripening the purification of the mind. It supports the purification of the mind. So doing, expressing devotions with mindfulness is conducive to happiness in the present moment and conducive to rebirth in a happy destination. And also in a destination where you meet the teachers, the teachings, the Buddha Dharma, future Buddhas again. 
So these practices that we're doing, faith-based, but based in wisdom, accumulating auspicious merit that supports the process of enlightenment is very, very valuable. We're given the instruction from Lord Buddha himself to build a monument so that people can pay respects in this way, so that they can gladden their minds with confidence, so that at the time of death they can be reborn in happy destinations. Ananda, after listening to the Buddha, instructing about how to cremate the body and to build a monument, Ananda is realizing that this is it. Buddha is going to pass into final Nibbana this evening. The Venerable Ananda went inside a dwelling. He stood leaning against the door bar and wept. I am still only a learner whose task has yet to be completed. My teacher is about to attain final Nibbana, my teacher who has compassion on me. And the Blessed One asked the bhikkhus, bhikkhus, where is Ananda? Lord, he has just gone inside a dwelling and he is standing, leaning against the door bar, weeping. I am still only a learner whose task has yet to be completed. My teacher is about to attain final Nibbana, my teacher who has compassion on me. The Blessed One told the bhikkhu, Come, bhikkhu, go to Ananda and say to him in my name, the teacher calls you friend Ananda. Even so, Lord. The bhikkhu replied and he went to the Venerable Ananda and told him, the teacher calls you friend. Even so, friend. The Venerable Ananda replied and he went to the Blessed One and after paying homage to him, he stood at one side. The Blessed One said to him, Enough, Ananda. Do not sorrow. Do not lament. Have I not already repeatedly told you that there is separation and parting and division from all that is dear and beloved? How could it be that what is born, come to being, formed, bound to fall, should not fall? That is not possible. Ananda, you have long and constantly attended on the Perfect One with bodily acts of loving-kindness, helpfully, gladly, sincerely and without reserve, and so too with verbal acts and mental acts. You have made merit, Ananda. Keep on endeavouring and you will soon be free from taints. Then the Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus thus, bhikkhus, the accomplished, fully enlightened ones in the past also had attendants who were to them what Ananda is to me. And the accomplished, fully enlightened ones in the future will also have attendants who will be to them what Ananda is to me. Ananda is wise, bhikkhus. He knows this is a time for bhikkhus to come and see the perfect one. This is a time for bhikkhunis to come and see the perfect one. This is a time for men lay followers, for lay women followers to come and see the perfect one. This is a time for kings, kings ministers, sectarians and sectarians disciples to come and see the perfect one. There are four wonderful and marvelous things in a universal monarch who turns the wheel of righteousness. What for? If an assembly of warrior nobles or brahmins or householders or monks should come to see him, the assembly is glad to see him. If he speaks, the assembly is glad at his speech, but when he is silent, the assembly is unsated. So too there are four wonderful and marvelous things in Ananda. What for? If an assembly of bhikkhus or bhikkhunis or men lay followers or women lay followers should come to see Ananda, the assembly is glad to see him. If he speaks there, the assembly is glad at his speech. But when he is silent again, the assembly is still unsated. That means they want to hear more from Ananda. When he had spoken thus, the Venerable Ananda said, Lord, let the Blessed One not attain final Nibbana in this little mud-walled town, this backwoods town, this branch township. There are other great cities like Champa, Rajagaha, Savati, Saketa, Kosambi and Banaras. Let the Blessed One attain final Nibbana there, where there are many prominent warrior nobles and Brahmins and householders who believe in the Perfect One. They will venerate the Perfect One's remains. The Buddha then goes on to explain that Kusinara used to be a truly great city and that Ananda shouldn't look down on it. But we see a little later that the Buddha had very good reason for choosing to enter Mahaparinibbana and be cremated here. So it's amazing, isn't it? This all happened where we are now. This is the ancient site of Kusinara. And uh, Ananda go into Kusinara, announce to the Malians of Kusinara tonight in the last watch, the perfect one's attainment of final Nibbana will take place. 
Come forth, Vasetas, come forth, lest ye regret it later and think the perfect one's attainment of final Nibbana took place in our town precincts and we did not go to see the perfect one in the last hour. That concludes part one of the talk leading up to the Mahaparinibbana. I encourage you now, if you've time, to listen to part two, which covers the actual Parinibbana and the time immediately after that. Otherwise, come back later when you have time.